Well, as I say, certainly good to be here. Beautiful fall, first weekend of fall, and, and it has not disappointed. For those that love fall, seen a lot of fall displays going up around the community, and and uh, certainly it's that time of year uh, for that, and and uh, look forward to the changing of the seasons. This morning we'll continue, or actually finish up our series that we've been in for the past few weeks, that uh, titled "In Christ We Are." So if you want to go ahead and turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. We will uh, finish up our study there. The word that we will look at this morning, and, and it's not a word that's foreign to us. We hear it uh, many times in relation to children. We hear it in relation to policies sometimes. Uh, the word is adoption. Adoption. Uh, we know the meaning of that mostly understand that but just for the sake of being consistent uh, Webster's defines the word adoption as this to take into one's family through legal means and raise as one's own child and I think it's important for us to bring that definition to mind as we study and look at this section of scripture because in fact Adoption is what we're talking about, and adoption is what Paul is writing to the church at Rome. So listen to this again, this definition. To take into one's family through legal means and raise as one's own child. So that, that has a lot of meaning to that for the Christian. Consider just a moment to be what it would be like to be an orphan. They may feel unloved unaccepted, maybe feeling lacking the, the human touch of, of a family, a mother or father, unnoticed without that family. That doesn't sound like a situation that any of us would choose to be into, but yet when we're outside a relationship with Christ, spiritually speaking, that's the kind of condition that we find ourselves. Now, one word changes all of that. Adopt. Adopt suddenly is changing everything. It, it's, uh, it offers hope to the person. We, it offers a future for that person that's brighter and more normal than what they had probably previously been into. But it does something for us as well. As a Christian, when we're adopted into Christ's family, into God's family, it offers us hope for a future as well, and that's what Paul here is telling us and telling the church at Rome as we continue to look at that. He uses that same word to describe the relationship that we have with God through Jesus. And it's the kind of relationship that God desires to have with us as well. We oftentimes, and we'll look at that a little later, we oftentimes think that it's God is distant and is far and, and removed from us, but that's, that's quite the opposite of what he desires. And when Paul uses these words, uh, adopt, uh, we can see that God desires us to be part of his family as well. So let's look at verses 18 through 17 in Romans chapter 8 this morning. And we'll see here what Paul is relaying to the church at Rome and us. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have re received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, we don't oftentimes think about being joint heirs with Christ, but that's in fact what Paul here is teaching and telling us and even saying that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and remember, we had a, a sermon on the Spirit in the empowered part through the Holy Spirit. That's part of the Spirit's job, and we'll see that here shortly. So I want to look at this 
last section that in Christ we are adopted. I want to look at it in a little different perspective in four things that God does not do in this adoption. And the first one is that God does not control us, but God loves us. God's not a controlling God, but he loves us. Oftentimes, people have the misconception that a relationship with God means uh, restrictive, demanding, uh, very closed in life. But that's quite the opposite, really. God's commands are not unreasonable. Oh, if you compare them to the world, what the world says is reasonable or unreasonable, they might be. But what we have to understand is that we're no longer free to sin, but rather we are, have the freedom to live our lives no longer in the bondage of sin. Look at verse 15 again. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we see that. If we recall, Paul told Timothy that through the Spirit that uh, God gave us the power and he gave us love of a sound mind. A sound mind. And that's one of these things that Paul's reminding people here. You've not received the bondage, or the spirit of bondage of fear. We've not gone from the bondage of sin into some other type of bondage when we're adopted into God's family. God's not over-controlling or unrealistic in his, expect, in his expectations, but he's a loving motivator. The standards that God gives us is, is what most people have trouble with because they don't want to let go of the world and don't want to let go of sin, so that's where the restrictive part comes in. I want the benefits of being a member of God's family, but I don't want to adhere to the rules of the family. And what family amongst us in this room or on the Facebook or on YouTube what family does not have rules at their house? Could you imagine the chaos that you would have in your homes if you, when you brought your child home and they were up big enough to toddle around and, and kind of halfway make a decision for themselves, you just let them run, run wild, do whatever they want to do. That would not work very well, would it? Okay, little Johnny, you have the choice. You can go to school or you can stay home. What do you think the child, most children will do? They would stay home. Who wants to go to school? All right, here we've got a good meal of, of green beans and potatoes and, and pork chops. And, or over here we have this big bowl of candy. Which would you prefer to eat? Well, what child wouldn't go for the bowl of candy? We have to guide our children, raising them to make good decisions. That's the same thing that God does to his children. It's not, it's not that it's restrictive, it's just guidance for what's best for us. And that's what he's saying here. We don't have that bondage of fear, that bondage of sin. We no longer have that. We have that, the power and the love and of a sound mind and guidance from a God and a Father who loves us. And that's one thing that we can see with this adoption. You'll hear people say, well, I, I don't have fun anymore. Uh, I can't have fun anymore if I'm a Christian. What is it, the fun that you're wanting to do? I have a lot of fun, and I'm a Christian. I feel like I do anyway. I don't go out and engage in sin, if that's what your idea of fun is. And that's the thing about it. The guidance from God's Word, the guidance from the Holy Spirit have drove me or driven or guided me to a path where those things that, that God disapproves of are no longer fun activities for me. And that's how we should look in our lives as we mature. Look over in Psalm 145, verse 9. That 145th Psalm, if that's not one that you have marked, it's a good one to, to go through and read. But I want to give you just out of verse 9. Listen, it says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. So God is good to all of us. God is good to all people. His mercy is available to all. All of his creation. Not a mean-spirited puppet master kind of thing. 
that would have us to be in misery and doubting and not really knowing? No, we wouldn't do that. Would, would, you, would you imagine for just a moment, would you undertake adopting a child and always have them wondering if you loved them or if they were part of your family? That would be misery, wouldn't it? That wouldn't be adoption at all. That would be some kind of, of, uh, of torture for that child, no better than what they were in. What about us as Christians? The devil would have us to, to doubt whether we were actually part of God's family. The devil would have us to actually doubt or wonder if God really loved us. We're no longer a bondage to fear, under bondage of that fear. We're delivered. We're adopted. There's rules, and there's standards, and there's ex expectations, just like there would be with any other family, any other aspect of our lives. But those things are good for us. I've not seen anything, I've not read anything in the scriptures that is bad for me. Any activity, any direction, anything to leave behind that's bad for me. You can find that out in the world. It's available. All kinds of things are available. And probably people wouldn't judge you if you weren't a Christian. They wouldn't judge you for partaking in those activities. And there's no restrictions on those things. None. That doesn't mean that they're good for you. God's not controlling. But God loves us. And in him... We're no longer under that bondage of fear. Secondly, and I talked about this earlier, uh, he's not distant from us. He's, he's near to us. Look at the back part of 15 again. But to have, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Some people believe and some even teach that God's not accessible. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Look again. Abba, Father. That, that's a spirit of sonship is what that is. We cry Abba or, or Father. And that means Daddy or Papa. Really in, intimate, that's Aramaic. And it really is an intimate word. That means you have an intimate relationship with that person. And that's the kind of relationship God desires to have with each of us through the Holy Spirit if we will only reciprocate, so to speak. If there's a distance put between God and you, it's not God's doing. It is almost always, well, it's always our doing. He wants us to be close. He wants us to kind of have the kind of respect for a, a loving father that we do here on earth. He doesn't want us to be at arm's length. He wants us to be in his arms. So how is it that we distance ourselves? Well, I'll just tell you. Lack of study distances you. Lack of prayer. Lack of assembling to worship with, with fellow believers. Those things distance you from the relationship that you would have. Just imagine again in your household. Imagine if you had your child, you brought them home, and they were up two, three, four, five years old, and you stuck them in a bedroom, and you never talked to them, and they never come out. Even today, they never sent you a text. No communication at all. How close would you be to that child? They come out and they eat their dinner and they go back in their bedroom. They come out and they get uh, their dress for school and they leave for school and they, they come back from home. They say, uh, they walk right by you and walk in the bedroom. How close of a relationship would you have with that child? You wouldn't, would you? But don't we do the same thing whenever we choose not to read our Bibles? Don't we do the same thing when we choose not to have a prayer life? And don't we do the same thing when we choose not to come to assembly with brothers and sisters and encouragement and hear the word preached? Does that not distance us in the same way that it would distance us from our family members here on earth? God's not distant. God doesn't desire to keep us at arm's length. It is us that keeps him at arm's length. And that's something that we have to remember and be reminded of. He wants us to be close. He desires us to be close. Because he doesn't reject us either. He affirms us. God does not reject us. 
he affirms his love for us. Verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Some of us really have to have that pounded into our heads. That you are the children of God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have repented of your sins, if you've confessed Jesus as such, if you've been buried with him in baptism to receive that forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and you're walking your daily life as best as you can as God has equipped you, you are a child of God. Period. That's what Paul's saying. And sometimes, for some reason, we convince ourselves that we're not. That we're not good enough yet. If you're covered by the blood of Jesus, you're good enough. Period. And that's what we have to remember. That's what we have to remember. That's why the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that's another reason it's so important not to reject, not to push out, not to, to, uh, to tamp down the Holy Spirit's leading in our life. We've read throughout this whole series, really, we've studied the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. And this is just another benefit, is that reaffirmation that you are a child of God. Are you going to mess up and fail sometimes? Absolutely. Are you going to make a poor decision sometimes? You guarantee it. Does that mean you're no longer a child of God? Absolutely not. And the Holy Spirit will reaffirm that to you if you will not listen to the devil who that's his job, he's going to be doing the opposite. He's going to be doing the opposite. He's going to be, oh, now you've messed up. Now you're no longer a child of God. Now you're no longer acceptable. That's not the case. And that's what we have to remember. God doesn't reject us. He affirms us. We can have confidence in that. The Holy Spirit in the guidance that he provides to us, constantly affirms those things. Gives us that inner assurance of God's truth. Convinces us of those truths as we study and we learn and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Again, that's why it's so important. So important to understand what these words say. Look at that again with me. Verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Just like if I were to, we were to adopt a child, <clears throat> whatever that child's name was before the adoption proceedings took place, it would be changed to the last name, my, my same last name, Hale. And they would be part of the family. Do you realize that God has given you his name? You are Christians. Jesus, the Son of God, is the name that we bear. And that's what he's talking about here. We are adopted into that same family. We are given his name. Given his name. He doesn't reject you. He loves you. He affirms that love for you. The Holy Spirit reminds us of those things. Which brings us to our last point about this. God does not withhold, but God gives. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, all, may be also glorified together. Now, you may not believe anything I say. I'm not going to intentionally mis mislead you or, or misguide you in, a, in something. But surely you will believe what the Bible says. Okay? Verse 17, I want to read it again. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And if you remember where we started with this, back up in, in verse uh, 15, or 14, I'm sorry. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are what? Are the sons of God. 
So if you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you do through baptism, and you're being led by the Holy Spirit, then what does that make you? A, a son of God or a daughter of God. And if you are a daughter of God, what's, what does verse 17, if children, then heirs. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Joint heirs of Christ. That's what we have to understand. We are the child of Children of the King, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, all that is, all that was, and all that ever shall be. You have a joint checking account. Many of you do, don't you? You realize that that's the same concept, don't you? You both can withdraw out of the account. Use it equally. Have the same authority over it to make decisions. Joint heirs, joint account. That's the same thing that we're seeing here that he's talking about. We have that's Jesus himself. Do we remember what Jesus said? I go to prepare a place for you, right? So that when I come again, you can be with me. Joint heirs. We're going to share in that in heaven. We are children of God. Now, here's the thing about it. With that knowledge, being a joint heir, joint heirs of Jesus Christ, knowing that we have been adopted into God's family, knowing that he has given us his name, how do you think we ought to act? Do you reckon we ought to act like we're children of God? Do you reckon we ought to act like we're part of his family? But we see many Christians, many Christians that don't act that way, do they? They distance themselves. Though they say, I have the name, they'll distance themselves from the conduct, from the, from the attributes that Christ would give to us, the forgiveness, the love, the compassion, the fruits of the Spirit, those types of things. Love. I said the greatest of these is love. That's what we have to understand. God does not withhold, but God gives. And Jesus went to prepare a place for his family, for his brothers and sisters to live with the Father. That's a concept that we just don't think about much, that we're joint heirs of Christ. God doesn't control us. He loves us. God's not far away from us, but desires to be close to us. He doesn't reject us when we mess up, but rather affirms that we are his. Well, there's got to be repentance there. Remember, we're not free to just go live in sin. Knowing in sin is, uh, is, is not approved of God. Knowing a, an action is not approved by God and just continue to live in it. That's not what we're called to. But he doesn't reject us because we goofed up. And God doesn't withhold from us. He doesn't withhold that promise of an inheritance because he didn't withhold from us his one and only son who give us first and foremost, he give us an example of how to live and how to be pleasing to God the Father and how to treat one another. And then he went and made the ultimate sacrifice and was crucified on a cross so that we might have the hope of that joint heir status to be a child of God. To all those that would believe and confess, repent and be baptized and live faithful until Christ returns or until we're called away in death. That's what it means to be adopted that's what Paul's talking about here to be adopted into that family is that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to overcome those things and through that empowerment we're transformed into something that we were not into something that we shall be because of God's love and all of those things in Christ we are love transformed empowered and adopted so I want to encourage everyone to, 
to realize what a great honor it is and to be encouraged by what great love that God shows to all of us by being willing to adopt us into his family and use that encouragement to spread that joy and that hope to those that are without it because this world can certainly use it. And if it doesn't come from us, it's not going to come from anyone else. It's our responsibility as Christians. They have to see changes in our lives. Well, you know what? I noticed that old Rob, he's changed since he was adopted into God's family. He, he acts different. He has a different outlook on life. He treats people differently. And it's all for the better. And that's what we should be able to, to say about each and every one of us. Change lives. Because there are too many spiritual orphans walking around in this world. Do we realize that? If they're out there without God, without Jesus Christ as their Savior, without being part of that, adopted into that family, they are an orphan. Spiritually. They have no hope of a future. They have no one that they can cry out to. And they have no one that will guide them other than the world. That's a sad place to be. Whether we're talking about being a physical orphan or being a spiritual orphan. So it's important. It's part of our main job is to let people know that God has a family and he wants them to be part of it. And that's what I want to encourage you this morning. God has a family. God loves you and God wants you to be part of that family. All you have to do, all that's required is that you accept Jesus Christ. That you hear the word and you believe that Jesus is the son of God. Was buried resurrected on the third day and is promised to come back again to take his family with him. That you repent of your sins, that you're baptized in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in that new birth. The old man is left behind. Change is a-coming because you've received forgiveness of sins and you have now the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide you. And I think I've covered pretty well the importance of the Holy Spirit this past four sermons. And I hope it's encouraged you to allow the Spirit to lead you more and more and to let more go and let the Spirit lead you. And you'd be faithful. you be faithful. You know, nobody said perfect, but you'd be faithful until either you're called away in death or Jesus Christ returns. We hear that trumpet sound. And you're part of the family. You're, you're a joint heir of Jesus Christ. That's what the Scriptures tell us. That's what the scriptures promise us. So I asked you, have you been keeping God distant? Draw to him. He wants you to be close. He wants you to have that kind of relationship where you're close and you depend upon him because he loves and cares for us all. If you've never accepted Christ today, you're invited to the family. If you've done that and you realize that, hey, you know what, I've not really been part of the family. I've been the one that's been running in and out of the room and just not speaking. And, and I've been distancing myself from my family. Because that's what we are. We're all family. We're all joint heir of Christ. All those that share the name, God's name, through his son Jesus as Christians, we're part of a family. And maybe you need to Reconnect with your family once again. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, Pass Me Not. Uh, that's uh, number 167. We're going to sing the first and the third verse of this hymn, and I want to encourage you to come if you have a decision to make as we stand and sing.